Good evening. My name is Alexander Ginn. I'm a junior here at San Anselm College. Uh, I'm very welcome to have you all here tonight. I have the pleasure of introducing Chloe Maxman. Hailing from rural Maine, Chloe Maxman served in the Maine House of Representatives after becoming the first Democrat to win a rural conservative district. In 2020, she went on to become the youngest woman ever to serve in the Maine Senate, State Senate at 28 years old. She received an honor, honors degree from Harvard College where she co-founded Diverse, Harv Diverse Harvard. Ms. Maxman is also the co-founder of the Just Me for Just Us, a Maine-based organization focused on rural youth civic engagement and climate organization. Uh, she and her campaign manager and best friend, Canyon Woodward, Word, co-founded uh, Dirt Road Organization, a no new nonprofit dedicated to rural organizing. They also wrote a book together called Dirt Road Vi um, Revival, How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It. We are excited that she's visiting San Anselm College as part of the Bean Distinguished Lecture Series. Her talk today is entitled Sca um, Scary and Scaled, Finding Common Ground in Politics. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Chloe Maxman. Hi everyone, my name is Chloe. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me down here in New Hampshire. Um, I'm gonna go to my first slide. So um, I just wanted to lay out a few disclaimers before I dig in. One is I'm super bad at graphic design. It's truly not my forte, so please forgive my, my very basic slides. Uh, number two is that Almost all of the work that I do is done with uh, Canyon Woodward, who was just mentioned in that very kind intro. We've been best friends since 2011 when we met in college. He was my campaign manager. We wrote a book together. We run an organization together. And so just pretend there's like a tall blonde guy standing next to me, and that's Canyon. And um, the third thing is that I really, as just to frame everything that I'm gonna talk about, I really wanna differentiate between values and party because I really identify as a values-based person and not as a partisan person, but um, I'll own that I'm a Democrat and I run as a Democrat, and so um, I'll talk more about my values which really lie around equal opportunity and access for everybody in this country, but that's really where I'm coming at this work from, not to be, not to be partisan. Also, just like on a very awkward note, I realized that my socks don't match and y'all can see them and I didn't have time to fix that, so please forgive me. It's, it's, uh, I usually just like sit at home with my dog and work all day, so um, I also think some of you saw my screensaver, so apologies for that as well, but it's all gonna be okay. So um, I grew up in Maine in a small town called Nobleboro of 1,600 people, uh, not too dissimilar from New Hampshire. I grew up on my family's farm. Uh, we raised deer. I don't know why my family decided to, to raise deer. That was a decision made before my, my conscious age, but uh, I was always super active on the farm and fishing with my brother, and I just grew up um, really invested in my in my rural hometown and growing up with my family and in my community I, you know when I look back I really don't remember politics being something that defined so many of the relationships that I had with people in my community instead we really talked about like are you a good person do you show up when someone is in need are you kind do you wave when you see folks driving down the road it was just a really different way of thinking about the world well back then it seemed normal but then when I went to college in Boston I realized how special it was and that it was a, a different flow of life I, um, I went to the local public high school and it was there that I first started to kind of dip, dip my toe into organizing and activism. I'm, I mean, I should be kind of embarrassed of these photos, but you know, this was me in high school. I was very, very awkward, but I, um, you know, I started to kind of understand all of the forces that were threatening my hometown as we, as we all do as we, when we grow up and I just wanted to kind of get involved and figure out what that looked like. So I started this thing called the Climate Action Club at my high school, which still exists to this day, which is kind of wild to me. We did really basic things, like no idling on campus and getting reusable bags circulated in our community. And when I look back now, it seems very basic. But at the time, 
you know, it was the first time that I kind of had a sense that when you get a group of people together, especially younger people, that you can actually make a difference and have your voice heard. That was not something that had entered my consciousness before, you know, because no, there was no protests, no organizing, no activism, um, and not really a whole lot of politics where, where I was growing up. Then I went, to, um, I went to Harvard for college, and uh, during my first year at Harvard, I learned about this, this big fossil fuel project that was going to pump tar sands through this very old pipeline across New England, through some of New Hampshire too. Some of y'all may remember it. It was called the Trail Breaker Pipeline. Um, just awful on so many levels from the tremendous extraction on indigenous land in Canada all the way through um, in Maine. It was going to run by Sebago Lake, which is the drinking water source for 20% of Maine's population. So um, I was at Harvard. I was reading about this. I was like, ah, I got to stop this. And so I went home and I, I interned with the Sierra Club and did some work in Maine that summer. Um, one of the fun facts that I learned is that this pipeline is actually 76% owned by ExxonMobil. And it was at this exact same time that the fossil fuel divestment movement was really picking up steam back in 2012, which I can't believe is actually that long ago. But um, you know, at that time, there were maybe a dozen divestment campaigns trying to get institutions to stop investing in fossil fuel companies. Um, and we were, we meaning a group of, of students in Boston were approached being like, hey, we all pilot some, some divestment campaign, see if your peers respond to it. And so we were like, okay. And I was like, yes, because I don't want Harvard to invest in Exxon because Exxon destroys a lot. And uh, so I went back to school that fall and co-founded Divest Harvard. And uh, that was a pretty crazy experience. Our first meeting in the fall of 2012, we had 10 people in a room. By the time I graduated, we had over 70,000 people who had signed on to our campaign. And it just grew super quickly. Um, a lot of the reason why it grew so quickly is because of the massive wealth of Harvard. Its endowment is $40 billion, which draws a lot of attention and privilege. And so we really we tried to leverage that and do, do our best to call attention to what was happening at the university. But um, this is where I met Canyon. So you can see Canyon in some of these photos. He's sitting on the far right in the top right one. And then he's kind of behind my head in the bottom right one. And he's the one holding up the banner, the tall one. And uh, we co-coordinated Divest Harvard together. And we had this really interesting experience because we had both done some work in high school, but when we were doing Divest Harvard work, we learned the actual tools of organizing. Um, like, what's a one-on-one? -on -one? How do you build power? What's a spectrum of allies? How do you facilitate a meeting? How do you train people? What does civil disobedience look like? All of those things were this whole new world of power building and really bringing community together to fight for, for some form of justice, for some form of change. And it was so incredibly empowering and inspiring and life-changing. And at the same time, both of us are from very conservative communities. Um, Canyon's from very, very rural Western North Carolina. So we would literally be sitting on campus, you know, like as we were doing marches or whatever we were doing. And we were like, this is awesome, but we couldn't bring it back home. We just, we just knew it. And that was so much of what formed our friendship. Um, one of the first things we ever did together was build a replica of the Keystone XL pipeline on campus. The, rep the replica was awful. I found a picture of it the other day, just like the worst artistic thing I've ever done in my life. But Canyon and I went to get gravel to kind of like imitate oil and tar sands. Um, and it was the first time either of us had ridden a public bus. So we got on this bus together and we knew the stop, but we didn't know that you had to press a button to get off the bus. And so we were like, oh, our stop is next. And then the bus just went whooshing right by. And uh, we had, it was just this whole complicated, embarrassing saga. And we had to lug a hundred pounds of gravel all across Boston. But, um, you know, it was, it was really so interesting for us to know, you know, we really didn't have much data, but we knew that 
you know, the marches and the protests wouldn't land well back home, that if we were going to have conversations about climate change or climate justice or these huge projects back home, that it would have to look really, really different because our community was different. So we started to feel this dichotomy between movement building, social movements, people power, and really what's needed in rural communities. So um, while we were having a time at college, there was a lot happening back home in rural America. So um, in 2009, there was no partisan lean amongst rural voters. It was evenly split. But by 2019, rural voters were voting Republican by 16 points. And today, rural voters are going Republican by 26 points. So again, I'm not saying this to be partisan, but just to show that there was something really big happening in rural communities in a very short amount of time. In the same time span, Democrats lost almost 1,000 state legislative seats across the country. The majority of those seats were, were in rural communities. So why does this matter? Y'all may know these statistics, um, but I always like to, to say them again because they help reinforce for me why, why rural America has so much political power just at the very core and making the case for why we need to invest resources and energy in organizing in rural communities. So in the 10 most populous states, 50% of the population resides, and that 50% of the population has 20 US senators. In the 40 least populous states, the other 50% live, and those are the rural states, and rural people have 80 senators representing them in Congress. So right there, rural folks have 80 senators to urban folks having 20 senators representing their interests. Uh, in battleground states, where everyone's gonna be investing their energy next year, 40% of voters are rural. So what I'm trying to point out is that on the state level, at the federal level, the, the, you know, who controls our state legislatures and our Congress is largely decided by rural voters. Rural voters have far more power than, than urban voters do just because of the makeup of our democracy. And so I think it's important to think about this when we think about, okay, we live in a representative democracy, so what does that mean? And how do we ensure that rural voters have their voices heard at the table as well as urban voices, but that they're, that they're equal, they have equal investment, equal attention, and uh, equal policies built for these communities. So, even though I'm a Democrat, I've just kind of pointed out how the Democrats have left behind rural America, which is my, which is my hometown. And uh, I just kind of wanted to talk about this phenomenon for a second, um, because I think it's important to kind of laying out why we need, not only why we need to invest in rural America, but how, you know, and how we kind of break away from some of the partisan trappings that have created these huge, huge rifts in rural communities. So um, I'll read this out loud. First, I want to say that there are so many incredible rural democratic organizers, rural organizers in general, who are doing hard work. I saw a tap. Are you involved with local rural politics? Heck yeah. Go you. That's so exciting. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, so many people holding down the fort in rural spaces, and, and everything I'm about to say is really like a larger macro critique of the party. Um, so one of the things that my party has done is really just like overlooked rural communities in general, because Democrats, their constituency, the people who Democrats want to go vote, um, mostly live in the cities. So it makes sense that you would go mobilize the people where they live. And so for Democrats, that's in the cities. There are a whole myriad of factors that have, have led to that that I don't need to go into because um, I don't want to be boring. But another point is that um, since Democrats have really concentrated their efforts in certain geographic spaces, they've kind of left behind rural spaces. And as I mentioned before, Democrats have lost a lot of state legislative power. And uh, that's important because almost all of the issues that matter to us as citizens who want good lives, all of those issues get played out on the state level. 
So um, here are some fun facts. In 2009, the Democrats controlled both chambers in 27 states, and by 2017, they controlled both chambers in just 13 states. In 2010, the Democrats controlled at least one chamber in 60 states, and by 2016, they controlled one chamber in 30 states. So in, six, in just six years, the Democrats lost half of the chambers that they controlled, which is um, pretty, pretty wild. Um, another, another fact um, is that Democrats just kind of have a um, in general, a bit of a condescending narrative about rural folks that rural people, um, I'm generalizing here, but that rural folks kind of feel at their core. And I think one, just to point out one big example that I've heard so much in my experience in my community is the, is the deplorables comment and just how much these, these things stick and these things stay. I mean, I, I've knocked on about 20,000 doors in my community and I can't tell you how many times I heard that, just the sense of the Democrats don't know who we are and they don't wanna know. Uh, another key point is that Democrats really talk about policy and not values. And like I was talking about the beginning, I was raised on values and not on policy. You know, I, I haven't ever talked to a Republican who wanted more expensive health care. I've only ever talked to people who want more accessible and more affordable health care. But sometimes we can differ on what that policy might look like to deliver affordable health care to American people. And so we, we get stuck there so, so much. I see it so frequently. Um, the Democrats have also abandoned movement building in terms of really lifting up county democratic infrastructures. In, um, you know, in 2008, Obama had this incredible email list and actually a really vibrant presence in rural America. He had 50,000 people on his Obama for America list who said they would run for office, but none of those people were ever activated. And uh, lastly, which is kind of where I come in, is that um, the Dems just don't run great campaigns in rural spaces, largely speaking. There are huge, huge exceptions to this. But, um, you know, some of the themes that we see in the Democratic Party are a huge reliance on consultants that don't come from rural communities. They're based in New York or, or in D.C. Um, some other generalized examples in, in, uh, in 2016, Clinton had one staffer to um, organize rural folks that was based out of her office in Brooklyn and hired towards the end of the campaign. You know, both Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid disbanded the House and Senate rural working groups. So there's like been a pretty intentional withdrawal of investment of, of like organizing, movement building, politicking in rural places. And uh, rural folks really feel that. Another one of my, this is my favorite quote ever, but um, the chair of the Democratic National Committee in 2018 says, you can't, do no, you can't door knock in rural America. And this one was a bit hard to hear because it was in 2018 that I first decided to run for office and I was going around knocking on doors in rural America and uh, not feeling a lot of support from the National Democratic Party messaging and uh, you know, realized that something had to change. So, in 2018, I decided to run for office in my hometown. And one of the big reasons that I did it is because I saw how rural Americans were really being left behind by so much of mainstream politics. And, and it was heartbreaking and I wanted my community to be really represented. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about our campaigns because we, you know, we really geared them to cater to rural folks' needs and, and way of living and uh, just find a new path in politics that felt more human and more values-based and less partisan and less negative. Um, but again, some more, some more disclaimers. Um, one, I'm white, my community is very white, Maine is the second whitest state in the nation, but not all of rural America is white. Rural America is very, very diverse and vibrant, but I'm just owning that, that my experience is from a white perspective. Um, I was 25 when I decided to run for office. I didn't have any kids, I wasn't married. I worked part-time, you know, at nights and in the mornings and I door knocked all day long. And so I had this privilege of really being able to spend my time door knocking. 
Maine has, um, Maine is kind of similar to New Hampshire. We have fairly small House and Senate districts. Our Senate districts are more comparable to other states, but you know, you can drive from end to end in an hour. Um, Candy and I had both done a lot of campaigning before we came to this work, so we could kind of put some of those concrete hard skills into practice right away. Um, Maine also has publicly financed state legislative campaigns, so you know, usually camp candidates are out there dialing for dollars, as they say, but um, we didn't have to do that, so I could spend more time door knocking. So I think all of this is just important to frame like how we created our campaigns and why, why we could make them the way that they were. So my first district is my, my hometown district, uh, District 88. It just got redistricted, which is so sad, but um, this is it. Uh, negative 16 percentage point DPI, never been held by a Democrat since redistricting. The community voted for Trump in 2016. Um, at the time that we ran, Maine was the most rural state in the country, and Lincoln County, where most of this district lies, um, was tied as the most rural county in Maine. Maine is also the oldest state in the country, and Lincoln County is the oldest county in Maine, and I was 25, and so there were some interesting dynamics there. I'm just gonna frame the next campaign because they, they both really did the same thing just on two different scales, but um, we won in 2018. And then in 2020, I was asked to run for the state Senate. And so we did that. The Senate districts are, are like five and a half times bigger than the House district. And so it was just such an exciting opportunity to do more movement building, which is kind of the theme of everything I care about. Um, in 2018, it was an open seat, but in 2020, we were running against a two-term Republican incumbent who was also the Senate Minority Leader, um, actually a really nice human, Senator Dana Dow. Um, he never lost a general election in his in and out of, of office of 20 years. Uh, in retrospect, the Bangor Daily News, which is the second largest paper in Maine, gave us 42 to one odds of winning, and we won by, um, we won by like 1%, one, 1%, one so um, it was very tight. So here are some other fun facts about our, our, um, our 2020 race, which really spanned all of Lincoln County, the, the rural and the, and the older county. So um, I kind of laid this out just to, just to kind of show that there were tricky districts. Um, we had to work really, really, really hard to win, but they were also, for us, just really important moments to organize regardless of if we won or not because they represent so much of what's happening in rural communities across the country. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive into what we did. So the first thing is that we just completely focused on grassroots organizing. Almost all of the people that volunteered with our campaign had never volunteered on any kind of campaign before. It was mostly because it was just like other young people that I knew, my friends from college, my friends from high school, people that I met while I was door knocking. And they were like, oh, this is cool. This feels a little bit different. Let me go see what this is all about. Um, and these are photos of some of the canvas days that we had, which were just really sweet moments. We. Um, we didn't canvas out of a party headquarter, but we rented out the North Nobleboro Community Center, and that's, that, was our, that was our home base. We also um, really tried to make everything feel so authentic and, and hand done and rooted in the community. So, um, you know, for example, the state party wanted us to devote three fourths of our budget to out of state consultants that would do all of our mailers and all of our like digital stuff and all of our palm cards and clincher cards. We said no and instead we paid young people to be able to work on the campaign. Um, small asterisk there, which is that the state party in almost every state offers resources like this to make running for office more accessible, which is so deeply important. But oftentimes those resources don't include the flexibility to cater towards rural campaigns needs because state parties are, are underfunded and the folks who work there are, are underpaid. So a lot of dynamics there. I'm not trying to put down anyone who works in a state party, but just to kind of point out some of the dynamics that 
really would not land well in our community. We did look at the original mock-up that the consultants had for one of our mailers, and we were immediately like, no, this will, it just looked, it just looked like something that you were gonna throw, throw in the trash, unfortunately. Um, and they were using the same mailer for all of the districts in the state, which was confusing to us. Um, our organizing strategy really seemed to work. Uh, in 2018, we had a primary at first, and the votes for our campaign alone were greater than the vote total for any previous Democratic primary in the district, just because we were so focused on voter turnout and connecting with new folks. Um, Everything from scratch, everything from scratch. We did our own trainings by scratch. We figured out how to, you know, create, create our, our mailers and our postcards. We did all of our volunteer trainings by ourselves. Um, we just tried to create, get everything kind of out of a party ecosystem and do it on our own. And people really resonated with it because it didn't feel like normal politics. It felt like you were just going and doing something good for your community. And so it was so exciting to see people really resonate with that. We did a lot of storytelling too, of kind of talking about politics in really different ways. And, and one of the mediums that helped us do that was our local paper, the Lincoln County News, which is still very widely read. Um, it's a very interesting paper, I love it so much. But uh, in 2018 and in 2020, each year we had over 100 letters to the editor in the local paper, uh, you know, all with people. We wouldn't, we wouldn't give people like a script or something to write, but just have them write it themselves. And so it just kind of created this cascade of really authentic messages about politics and our campaign and what it felt like to work with us or have one of our volunteers knock on your door. And the, the cool thing about uh, rural communities is like people read the paper and they're like, oh, my neighbor wrote a letter to the editor. Oh, I'll go talk to him. Or, you know, now I know I can vote for Chloe. She must not be that bad. Um, we also, we repurposed old campaign signs and most of the signs that you would see when you were driving down the road were hand-painted signs. We would have local artists come together. We'd have these big paint parties. Um, I wish I had, I should have put more photos of the signs in here because they were so cool. And uh, you know, it was like the reason why people voted for us is because of these signs. I mean, they would have loons on them or canoes or there was one that was a big pallet that said uh, glowy for Chloe on it and it had fairy lights on it and it was lit up at night at somebody's house. <laughs> And so there were just all of these different ways that things, I don't know, it just, it felt different. Like it wasn't one of those awful, glossy, corrugated cardboard situations. I mean, we did have some of those because the districts are big. But, you know, for the most part, they were all repurposed, hand-painted signs. Uh, but at the core was a lot, a lot of door knocking, mostly on my part, um, because I felt the responsibility to, but I remember one day I looked down at my knuckles and I was like, oh my God, my knuckles are gonna be white forever. But I knocked on a, a lot, a lot, a lot of doors. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but um, almost all of the doors that I knocked on were Republicans and independents. You know, I, uh, when I started this work, I had never heard of the term deep canvassing, which I think is something that's kind of popular in the political realm right now. Usually when you campaign, you go up to a door and you try and you have like five minutes with that voter because your goal is to knock as many doors as possible. And in those five minutes, you're supposed to figure out if that voter supports the candidate or not. And uh, it's just a really, I've done that kind of door knocking before. I've done it in New Hampshire, I've done it in Maine. And uh, it's just really extractive. It makes the voter feel weird. It makes me as a canvasser feel weird. It's, um, it's just not very meaningful. But when I, when I went around as a Democrat talking to Republicans, I knew it was just kind of obvious, like, duh, I can't just stand here for five minutes and expect someone to cross party lines and vote for me it demanded a different type of canvassing. So something that we stumbled into, it feels like a little too flippant, but we didn't know any of like this ethic around a different type of canvassing. It's just something, it's something that we figured out by listening to people who had different perspectives from us and learning from those perspectives. You know, really trying to 
find common ground and not focus on what makes us different and agreeing to disagree, which is a really powerful tool. Um, I don't agree with anyone 100% in my life and I don't expect any voter to agree with their politician 100%. So trying to create more space for that through our door knocking. We also, like I've said so many times, just tried to put it out there as loudly as possible that we were really committed to a different type of politics. One of the, um, one of the things that we did was we, run, we ran 100% positive campaigns, never said, uttered, whispered, wrote, typed a negative word about our opponents or really anybody in politics. Um, and we really tried to form relationships with unlikely allies like our county sheriff, the former chair of the county Republicans um, to just show that this really isn't about party, it's about representing our community. And um, I wrote down some quotes from voters that we got in 2020 that showed how all of this resonated with people. Um, one person wrote, I've been meaning to write to you for a few weeks ever since I took note of the relentlessly positive tone of your campaign mailings. We were pretty relentlessly positive. People got a lot about it. Um, and this is from a Republican voter in 2020. I went out and cast a ballot for Chloe and nobody else because I am so fed up with how everyone else is campaigning. So um, it was pretty wild in real time to get this feedback from people about how, how it was landing for them. Okay. But this is my favorite slide. Um, how many of y'all have canvassed before? Okay, a lot of people, amazing. So does this minivan screenshot look kind of familiar? Maybe a little bit traumatizing? Uh, yeah, canvassing can be pretty difficult. But um, so for those who don't know, minivan is the app that you use when you go door to door. It tells you like the voter's age and their name and their party affiliation. And it also shows you under survey question history if they've been canvassed before. And since I'm a Democrat, I have access to the Democratic database. So in the left two, since you can see none under survey question history, that means that these voters who were not Democrats had never been contacted by a Democratic campaign or canvasser in their entire voting history. And I, we, Canyon and I were running into this every single day and it was mind blowing. You know, the amount of people who would be like, I've never had a Democrat knock on my door, or even worse, I've never had a politician knock on my door. Um, so the one in the middle right, you can see that the last time this voter was canvassed is in 2008, so a decade, a decade before I was out there. And the one on the far right was someone who actually had been canvassed. Um, these screenshots are from 2018, but so in 2018, you can see that they were canvassed by um, the state Senate in 4218, and they were marked as four lean GOP, which means that, um, that they were probably voting Republican for the state Senate candidate, but I was the state house candidate, and I went to that person's door, and they voted for us. So we were encountering these examples um, just of how, how these folks have been left behind by the Democratic Party. And, um, you know, I, it was so life-changing for me because I think as humans, it's kind of natural to hold thoughts or judgments or prejudices about folks who are different than us, especially when it comes to politics, because politics is so personal. And it's really difficult when you have those conversations with folks who are different than you to kind of set those judgments aside. But um, that was really the work that I learned how to do. And I listened to all of my neighbors who were not Democrats and I learned so much from them and they changed my life and they made me a better and more empathetic human by taking the time to share their stories. Um, I wanted to share just like the most life-changing story for me, which was in 2018, I was canvassing in the most conservative town in my district. We were the only Democrat on the ballot to win in this town, like from hyper-local to, to the Congress level, we were the only Democrat to win in this town. And um, I went down this guy's driveway, he was in his garage working with his friends on his snowmobiles, and we, he, came, he kind of came marching out to me, and I was like, hey, I'm Chloe, I'm running for state rep, just stopping by to hear what's on your mind. And he said, I just have one question for you. 
do you believe in Medicaid expansion? And I attempt to be an honest politician because I'm too honest to a fault as a, as a human being. And so I said, yes, I do believe in Medicaid expansion. And uh, I'll never forget it. He pointed like this and he was like, you can leave now. And um, also because of that relentlessly positive thing before, I was like, oh, he agrees with me. Easiest door ever. This took 30 seconds, I can move on. But uh, I read his body language and it was more like, a, a no get off my property type gesture. But I was so, I just met this guy and I was so taken aback at how quickly things went from, you know, we could have been friends to get off my property that I was like, can you just tell me what you're thinking? I'd love to hear your story. Even if you don't vote for me, can we just talk about it? And so he told me the story about how he grew up, you know, in the house he was living in currently, and he grew up without any electricity, without running water, and he just worked very hard for everything in his life, and part of his life ethic meant paying for your own health care. He just believed in private health care. It's not that he didn't want folks to have affordable health care, he just didn't agree with, with Medicaid. Um, and so even though I do agree with Medicaid, I believe in Medicaid, I could hear his story and where he was coming from and have a lot of space, a lot of space for it. And we ended up having just this really powerful conversation and he ended up voting for me. I went back in 2020 and I was like, oh my gosh, I hope he's still with me because I, I thought of him every day when I was like, who am I voting for? Who am I representing? I thought of him. And I went back in 2020 and he said he was gonna vote for me again. So. That was just one of the biggest stories that I always keep in my mind for not letting the negativity overwhelm um, how we approach politics. Um, this is a much shorter story, but there was another, another guy in, in 2020 who like, immediately did not want to talk to me because I was a Democrat. And uh, I was like, I, I, in 2020, by this time on my like 13,000th door, I was like, oh God, I just can't deal with this anymore. And I was like, can you just tell me why? And again, we had another great conversation and um, he ended up voting for me. He sent me a picture of his ballot on voting day with all of the Republicans voted for, except for me, I was the only Democrat. So um, it was so interesting, just this model of, um, of listening and respecting and trying to connect, not persuading people that one's right and the other is wrong, but finding common ground. And I know I had I titled this talk Scary and Sacred because it's for me walking up to a stranger's door and knowing that we have so much not in common, that's terrifying. And it's terrifying for those who have canvassed to do that um, you know, 50, 60, 100 times a day. It can be really scary. But when you find those moments of connection, when you can build a relationship with someone that transcends all of these really destructive, divisive narratives, that to me is really sacred and something that I never, ever took for granted, um, especially when I got in office. Um, even though our method was really resonating with our community and we were winning these, these kind of very tricky districts, um, the state party did not love us so much because um, we weren't you know, utilizing their resources. And so I just kind of like putting this up there. And I think especially for young folks running for office or anyone interested in running for office as a young person that um, like a lot of this stuff comes, on, comes up of like, you're not a campaign veteran. So, um, so you should kind of learn how to do it the traditional way. And these, yeah. You know, I, I think they thought that I could knock more doors if I had a driver, but I um, actually was a lot faster by myself. I had all these tips and tricks. If anyone ever wants to run for office and knock on tons of doors, I can, I can help you with that. But um, these are some pictures of canvassing in my really beautiful district from, uh, you know, I'd start canvassing in February, so it was obviously snowing, and, you know, through the fall, and the one on the top was just like a week before the election, so. Um, canvassing through the seasons in rural Maine. Um, these are some, these are kind of very strange photos, but um, sometimes uh, folks would put up my sign next to their Republican signs, and I, I was, 
uh, I don't know, it kind of meant something to me, and so I tried and take pictures of it, but I didn't want anyone to see me taking photos and make people feel uncomfortable, so these are my really awful photos, but just um, like examples of how support for our campaign was not something that was just kind of kept, kept hidden, but that people were proud to put um, on their lawns. Like the one on the left, you can see Chloe Maxman, Trump, and Susan Collins back there. So um, I feel like this narrative gets tied up with the fact that I served for four years in the Maine legislature, and I tried my absolute very best every day to represent my community, everybody in my community. For me, that meant sponsoring bills that came from the many thousands of conversations that I had with constituents. I just wanted to highlight a few because I'm really proud of them. Um, one on the right is, uh, so a third of Mainers and a third of my district are registered independents. But in Maine, um, up until recently, we had closed primaries, which means that independents couldn't vote in a primary and choose the candidate that would appear on the November ballot, even though they're paying for those elections. And so um, I sponsored the bill to open Maine's primaries. And so next year will be the first year that Mainers can vote in a primary. And it was a bipart all of these are bipartisan bills. All my bills were bipartisan bills. Um, so I was pretty excited about that one. Huge, I mean, that's a good example of um, it's something that is really values-based for me and not really based on party identity. It's about increasing access to voting. Um, the Expand Good Sam Maine, good, sorry, Expand Good Sam bill in, um, in my community, like so many communities across the country, the opioid epidemic is, is just ravishing our communities and it's uh, really, really horrific and awful. In 2021, we had a record number of overdoses in Maine and we got this data that 90% um, of Mainers were not calling 911 when there was an overdose because they were afraid that they'd get arrested um, when, when first responders and police came to the scene and um, just really, really not a good situation. And so I worked with the recovery community. It was their bill, they did all the work. I was just the conduit for their incredible organizing. But um, we passed a Good Samaritan law, which increases protections for folks at the scene of an overdose. And so we have the strongest Good Samaritan law in the country right now in Maine um, because of this incredible coalition of folks. And um, the last one is the Pine Tree Amendment, which did not pass, but someone else is sponsoring it again this year. But uh, basically that would add a constitutional right in the Maine Constitution to the right to a clean environment, which gives the people power to sue their government if the government violates that right, and uh, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool bill and uh, also very bipartisan. So, um, so possible to run for office in communities where your identity might be different than the folks you're representing and work on really, really good policy that has such a huge impact on people's lives. Uh, so after, after 2018 and 2020, you know, through, through those experiences, Canyon and I had all of these voice memos and scribblings and random Google Docs with all of the things that we were learning and reflecting on during our time during doing this work and we condensed it into a book called Dirt Road Revival that was published just about a year ago um, that, tells a that tells a story of our work and lays out a more concrete roadmap for folks who want to organize in rural communities. And uh, we just started a nonprofit to be able to do this work and get lots of people elected to office, a lot of, you know, support as many people as we can doing this work on the ground in, in rural communities. It's called Dirt Road Organizing. And, um, you know, it's exciting. It's the first full-time job that I've had since college because organizing work doesn't pay very well, so I've been working many, many jobs since I graduated. Also serving in the legislature does not pay very well, though I think New Hampshire is the lowest paid of any, any state, um, which is an extremely, we can have a whole nother conversation about accessibility and equity and running for office and serving in the legislature, but we can save that for another time. Uh, for now, I just wanna say thank you so much for listening to me talk for so long. Um, it was really an honor to share all of this with you and I um, um, would love to hear if there are any comments or questions or any of that good stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of detail your 
favorite and least favorite part about canvassing and just about being in um, state office? Because obviously there's a lot of rewarding parts, but I know it's not all glamorous, so yeah. Mm. Ooh, yeah, such a good question. Um, I think everyone has really different experiences of it and certainly very different experiences based on personality but also identity. And so um, again, I just, like I had my challenges with it but I'm moving through the space as a, as a white woman and so just, just naming all of that. Um, you know, for me, this canvassing is very, I'm a huge introvert. I don't I picked the long, wrong line of work, but um, I'm a really, really private, quiet person. And so canvassing for me is super draining. It's just really, really exhausting. And um, it's a lot of emotional work too, because you're just having these really complicated, heartfelt conversations with people every day. And um, people aren't always super nice. <laughs> but my favorite part is, is those sacred moments where I feel like you can access something when you're canvassing that you can't in any other time of life. I mean, when else do you just get invited to sit at someone's kitchen table and they make you tea and you can talk about politics? I mean, uh, that's a pretty rare opportunity that I, I tried not to take for granted. Um, and serving in office, I mean, the, the power of state policy is so huge. And so working on that and being able to find common ground and workshop the language, it's just so meaningful and exciting. Uh, but politics is, is not a, you know, it's kind of a contact sport these days, uh, both internally and like just from the outside. And so that's, that's a lot, that's a lot. Yes, I can hear you, yeah. yeah. I, so here's the most common door that I would knock at. Um, my friend Dave Trumbull and I both ran in red towns locally here. <laughs> So you, you come up the driveway and you see Biden, you know, S-U-C-K, on, yeah. the, on the garage. But you've got a Democratic woman on your list. And you walk up to Jeb coming out of the garage like your snowmobile guy. And you say, I'm campaigning um, for state rep and I, I have uh, Diane on my list. And he says, you're running as a Democrat? And I say, yes. Uh, I had to choose a party. I wasn't independent. You know, I couch it with that, but I had to choose a party. And he says, she doesn't want to talk with you. What's your response? Hmm. And her Prius is in the driveway next to his extra cab, black, jacked up pickup truck. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, obviously a lot to unpack in that dynamic. Um, I think, you know, from, I, I know that situation well. And, um, you know, the way that I would do it is I would talk to the guy first and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go look for the voter who was on my list necessarily. And so I could build, I could build a, have a conversation with him and then be like, is your wife home? Or do you think I can count on your wife's support? Or where's your wife at? Um, I found a voice, I never ever recorded um, any of my conversations, but I did, my phone accidentally recorded one of my um, canvassing conversations one time and I was listening to it the other day. Like I had no idea that it was, um, that it was recording obviously, but it was, it was this situation and um, it, it went well. He didn't shut me down, but uh, yeah, you know, it was like seven minutes of me talking with him and then at the end it was, is your wife home? Can I talk with her? Here's, please give her my phone number if she has any questions. But every, every conversation is so unique, it's hard to, uh, yes. That anger is scary, but. Yes, heck yeah for running, that's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Did you can, uh, canvas with the Democratic candidate uh, uh, people or did you only go to Republicans? I went to I went to Democratic doors in 2018 when I had a primary um, because of the closed primaries in Maine only Democrats were going to be voting in the primary. After that, um, I don't remember talking to a Democrat unless they were. There's some Democrats who were kind of like accidentally registered as a Democrat, but they're they always vote Republican. Um, so there were some of those folks, but there was no intentional. But 
I should name really clearly that one of the reasons I could do that is because the Lincoln County Democrats, our county, our county Democratic Committee, are awesome. I could not have won without them. And so it, they were doing a lot of the canvassing for Democrats and focusing on Democratic turnout, which meant that I could focus on um, Republican and independent turnout. We also had most of our volunteers go and talk to Democrats instead of going and talking to the Republicans because um, it's just a, it can be a lot. It can be a lot. Um, and is, you know, it's, it's easier to start with, with saying, oh, hey, I noticed you haven't voted in a few cycles. Can we, can we get to the polls this year and then move on to, um, can, I, can I interest you in voting for a Democrat this year? Yeah, I mean, I and I, I think it's um, so. For those who didn't hear, is like, two. Do we have two different ways of canvassing? One where you just kind of go talk to your own party, and one where you go talk to folks from a different party. Um, and I think in my, in my experience, I've trained a lot of people to go talk with folks from the opposite party, and so I think it requires just like a lot of training and and just talking it through, and. Um, you know, just kind of making sure that you're gonna feel safe and good when you're doing that work. And if you don't wanna do it, that's totally fine because we also need to go talk to the Democrats and we need to go talk to low turnout Democrats and, uh, you know, make sure that everyone feels like they have access to the information they need to vote. But it's just a different, it's a different style and it gets trickier every year as things get more and more divisive. Thank you. So how did you handle getting your lists? If, if, the, if the Democratic Party, I know you used minivan, yeah. so what'd you do? Oh, I used my secret weapon named Canyon, mm -hmm. who uh, is just kind of a van genius, and so he created a canvassing universe for me that, um, so, you know, normally what happens is that the state party creates the universes, and then they're kind of skewed towards, um, Towards the towards that party, uh, which is why a lot of these races get get lost. So Canyon, it was all Canyon. Uh, he predicted our win number down to like dozens of votes um, both times, which is pretty crazy. So, so he had access to the list. He, he had, access had access to the to list. Van. Yep, he had access to the list and the scores in Van, mm -hmm. and so he created a, a list for me that was basically outside of the Democratic voting universe, and so really talking to folks in the middle. Um, not so much on the extremes, but really in the middle, leaning away from Democrat. Just a, Everybody needs a canyon. Yeah. Everyone needs a canyon. Canyon is very talented. I'm just very, very blessed. I see someone back there. Yeah. He is. That's what dirt, dirt Road Organizing is all about. So um, if anyone wants canyon services. I always have a question. My students are here. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, just cut you off. Hi. Yeah. Um, sorry, it sounds like you're still having a conversation. Sorry, <laughs> I, I see you. Yeah. Well, I canvassed when we didn't have whatever this app is. Yeah. Um, I had a clipboard and paper. I'm wondering if my students actually have ever canvassed before. But we're not here to talk about canvassing necessarily. We're here to talk about civic engagement too yeah. for our class. So our class is here to think about how do you become civically engaged. And I'm sort of thinking about um, civic education generally. You talked a little bit about your high school, and that's really you said you weren't a political person. And then you became political, and you everybody had reusable bags or something like this. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk about your evolution to become a political person, to become civically engaged, maybe the role of public schools, if that's something that happened. And um, it sounds to me like environmentalism is something that all that's sort of a bipartisan issue that maybe was an on ramp for your activism. So thanks. Yes. Thanks very much. Good question. Thank you for for zooming it out. Um, I love getting into the campaign nitty gritty. Um, I, I do a lot of work with young, my other job is doing all civic engagement with, with students in Maine and uh, you know, f for me, I did not consider myself a political person when I was younger. I never ever ever thought I would run for office, mostly because I thought um, I had to have like a law degree and a business degree and be married and have children and like live in my forever home before I could even think about running. Uh, but anyways, 
that's a bit of a tangent. You know, I think that the more that I got involved with change making work, the more that I realized that the the barriers to building a more inclusive and equitable society really, really, they were, those barriers were rooted in politics and more specifically with the people that we elect. You know, we can focus on, on corporations and outside influence and, you know, and the media, but at the end of the day, the people who are making the choices about our lives are the people that are on our ballots in November. And um, that just became clear and clear to me. It was something that I couldn't avoid. It's something that I felt like I couldn't organize around either because it felt like, it still feels like no matter how much people power we have, no matter how much consensus it feels in our communities that politics isn't responsive and it doesn't listen. So, um, and so that's how I became politicized because I was just really, really frustrated with, with our political system and its lack of representation, um, especially for young people and for rural communities. So it was a long, a long and winding road. But um, I, you know, I think too that um, you know, when I do work with, with students these days, like I didn't know until I ran how the state legislature worked. I didn't know how one even filed to run for office. I barely knew who my down ballot candidates are, you know, my state legislative candidates, my municipal candidates. And, um, and I feel like that's really, I see that so much, you know, and um, I wish that was in my public education and it, and it wasn't. So many of the things I'm talking about I didn't learn in any schooling that I got. So it's cool that y'all have professors who are who are getting you up to speed on everything. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, what is your biggest advice on getting people to kind of let their guard down or knock those barriers down? Because when you're canvassing, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes people just straight up say no. Yeah. But what also really hurts is when people, you can feel the vibe that people are reluctant to talk to you, which is sometimes even worse. So what's your advice in those situations? How can we change the tides of those conversations? Mm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, like you said, people just shut you down and that's it. And that's okay, you know, it's their property and their home and who knows what's happening in their life or in their day. But, um, you know, for me, so much of it was just trying to make it more human. So being like, you don't have to vote for me, I just wanna hear what's on your mind. Or um, just being chill, you know, just like making it less formal. Like so much of it was tone and body language and just, you know, or talking about like, oh, we went to the same high school, that's cool. Like, did you have Mr. whatever as your teacher? You know, just like little things like that that help you connect. Um, because I think people have a right to be scared to talk about politics these days. It's almost never easy, even with people you agree with. And, um, you know, so just trying to be like, we got to build a relationship first before we can dig into the hard stuff. Like, it's, it's weird because in campaigning, it's really the only time where you go from like, like, hi, I don't know you at all, to let's talk about the most divisive issues of our time. Like, we don't do that in any other relationship in our lives. So... Um, trying to build that into campaigning. And sometimes, like, in states where we have smaller districts, you can go to people's houses two or three times and build that relationship over time and earn it instead of just pretending like it's been given to, to politicians because we put our name on a sign. Yeah. I am so happy that all of you came today. And please... Um, my email is not on here, but I have my business cards with me for once in my life. So if I can do anything to support the work that y'all are doing, I'd really, really love to. And I'm just so grateful that, that y'all came out today. I know, I know life is busy and the world is hard, so I, I really appreciate it.